My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please. Reading today's gospel lesson from Mark, I couldn't help but consider its relevance for our own time. In fact, it almost seems as if Mark were writing about our own times. Wars, earthquakes, famines, not to mention messianic-like figures. There's a certain apocalyptic feel to our times, and one has to wonder if Mark wasn't speaking of our own age. While Mark's warnings resonate with many of us, I'm cautious about seeing our times as the end times. I'm saying this, in saying this, I mean not to dismiss the real concerns many of us have about what is happening politically, nor to ignore the heavy weight we feel in our hearts or the significant ecological, humanitarian, and political iniquity, injustices unfolding around us. Indeed, we are living in troubled times. There's extraordinary evil in our world today, and we can no longer ignore the ruthless and vicious violence and oppression unfolding not only in distant lands such as Palestine and Ukraine, but also in our own country and communities. Yet these are not the end times, as so many popular Christian evangelists like to suggest. Nor is our experience of these events unique to us. They've long been with us since the dawn of human civilization. Still, I can't help but avoid the news and every new year wonder if the next year will be better than the last. I feel like I've been hoping for better years since the beginning of the pandemic. And yet things seem to get worse and worse. After a while, I tire of the litanies of disasters and wars and simply want to go off into some desert and hide from the plagues of our time. Yet I live in the here and now, and God has called me and all of us to be present to and with the suffering of our world. In times such as our own, it's easy to grow discouraged, forlorn, and anxious. I suspect I'm not alone in wanting to hide from the problems of the world, nor am I the only one who wonders what assurance and confidence I might have in our present age. Perhaps we may even feel like Hannah in the first reading and find ourselves deeply distressed and weeping for God to hear and answer our prayers. Yet the psalmist reminds us that God will look with favor upon his suffering servants. Mark wasn't offering warnings to us who live in this apocalyptic age to scare and alarm us. Rather, Mark is challenging the readers of his day and in the generations that follow to ground ourselves not on the ways of men, but to root ourselves in the living God, Jesus Christ. He knew well we must trust, as the psalmist says, that God is our refuge and strength, a very help in our times of trouble. No building... And this we have to pay attention to. No building or human institution could ever save or sustain us. Only the living God himself, Jesus Christ. Christ is the cornerstone upon which we build our house. As he reminds us in Matthew's gospel, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Mark 
and the other evangelists were not Pollyannish. They knew well the real injustices and evils of this world. Mark, in particular, felt the weight of the world's problems. Living in and writing in Rome around the year 70 AD, 40 years after the death of Jesus, Mark and the Christian community gathered with him felt the extraordinary oppression of Roman imperialism, as did thousands of people across the empire. From ancient Palestine to the city of Rome, the Romes asserted a terrifying force of power through violence and innumerable injustices. You think our times are bad. Just take a look at the Roman period. Many felt the terror of the emperor, much in the way we feel fear contemporary dictators such as Trump, Putin, and Netanyahu. Mark was no stranger to the thirst for power and the extremes to which militaristic leaders would go to wield their might. Still, Mark and the small Christian communities gathered across the city of Rome and the various corners of the empire knew the power of God to redeem and save. They also knew they were part of a movement to transform and change the world for good, not by the sword, but by the plowshare. Born anew through the waters of baptism and fed by Christ himself in word and sacrament, the early Christians shared with Christ in, in, their, in his work of bringing new life from the hardened and rocky hearts of the oppressors of his day. They knew they were the seeds of the new creation. As St. Paul recalls in 2 Corinthians, therefore, as if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new comes. And so are we. Despite evangelical warnings of upcoming doom and disaster and God's wrath against anyone who will stand in their way, the true apocalypse is not one of death and destruction, but rather of new birth. And like all births, we feel the pains of new life emerging from the womb. Now is not the time for us to retreat and hide within our comfortable habitats, but rather to be more vigilant in our mission to love and serve all God's people as Christ loved us. God, through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, is bringing about a new creation, transforming the injustice and evil of this present age into life for the age to come. Yet God's work begins small, with the humble and the meek, the poor and the lowly. And we must not forget that. God's ways are not our ways, but rather paradoxical. And this is where evangelical preachers get the apocalypse all wrong. They think God will act with fiery might to destroy and kill. But Jesus shows otherwise. Rather than wield weapons, Jesus embraces a radical way of love by caring for the poor and the marginalized. Knowing full well he would taste the cruel and isolating death of the cross for his compassion for the poor. Think of that. Christ died on the cross not because of what he said, but what he did. The world couldn't handle that. But that was the only way he could usher in a new life. Life wasn't going to come from violence, but out of radical love for all God's people. I sometimes worry in our attempt to confront the injustices of our times, we embrace the very methods of the oppressors, not realizing that by doing so we inflame the fiery debates and fights of our day. 
Well, they know our anger is real and felt deep within, often urging us to scream and attack those on the other side with ad hominem assaults. The truth of the matter is that this is not how justice is brought about. We know as much from the witnesses of the early Christian communities to the pacifists of the 20th century, such as Bonhoeffer, Gandhi, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King. Evil is never overturned by evil. Rather, such an approach only fosters evil. No war has ever abolished injustice. Think of that. No war has ever abolished injustice. We still have Nazism. We still have fascism. In fact, probably more so today and in much more insidious forms. Instead, war only spreads hate and makes things work worse. Instead, we must be like the early Christian community in the years and decades following Jesus' death and resurrection. Several writers and historians of their time relate to us in their writings the radical way of life the early Christians lived and how their way of life actually enabled the community to grow at a rather remarkable speed. While we might suspect the growth was due to the preaching of the day, that largely wasn't the reason why the Christian life expanded and grew across the empire. Rather, the community grew because it was countercultural. Where marginalization, violence, and death were the norm in society, the community welcomed and embraced with compassion and care the oppressed and those who were forgotten. Quite literally, infants and children at the time were left to die in the streets if born into difficult circumstances. Widows and divorced women faced extreme hardship and isolation, often death as well. In response, and imagine this, this was actually considered radical for the time. In response, Christians sought out those left to die and welcomed the women into their homes and communities. Several Roman writers at the time wrote about the way the Christians, with some shock and surprise, and noted how the communities grew. Many were drawn by the early Christian communities because they felt this radical love. They experienced it consistently all the time. It was a source of hope for them. It's what's preventing us from doing the same. To be fair, good things are being done by the Christian community today. Yet I really wonder if it is a fundamental part of our life, or does the church today act more like an NGO and do nice charitable things here and there? You can do good things, but is that actually a way of life? Is it consistent? Do our faith communities set care and support for the poor, the unhoused, the hungry, and marginalized as a priority, or do we simply continue our comfortable ways of life and maintain our churches as clubs or social organizations that occasionally care for God's beloved poor and marginalized? Do we embrace each other? And here's this, it works even in here. Do we embrace each other with love, a radical love and compassion? Or in our faith communities, are we first to say, you're not like me, so we're not going to get along. I don't like the way you think, so we divide. Churches do this. That is not the way of the gospel. That is not what's going to call conversion. That's not what is going to cause a radical love to transform this world. 
And I'm not just talking about our church. I'm talking about all churches. I might get myself in trouble with the bishops. But quite frankly, the church operates today much like the Roman Empire did 2,000 years ago. We're more concerned about upholding hierarchies more concerned about sustaining institutions. But are we concerned about embracing a radical love for all God's people? And I say this to myself. (laughs) So believe me, I'm not trying to preach to you here. (laughs) I'm saying this as well about myself. Elizabeth is feeling like I'm preaching to her back there. (laughs) But it's true. Do we love one another? Do we make time to come together in this space? What you're doing here is important, by the way. Because I can tell you in this room there are people who are suffering, who are struggling. People who are alienated and disenfranchised. Here, we can create a place where all are welcome. If that becomes our way of life, it will outshine more than any church building. The church is more than the building. It is you. We are called to share with Christ in ushering in a new creation. And quite frankly, the world desperately needs us to rise and embrace our vocation to be stewards of God's justice and peace, love and grace for all peoples, particularly when in the coming years we will see more and more migrants and refugees fleeing oppression and more and more people without home or shelter. Pay attention when you walk through the parks. Are there many Christians there? Our work is not about doing good things or being nice. Rather, we meet and gather to be radical communities of love who are one with those whom God has entrusted to us. We must be and live a radical love for Christ. For only then can a new creation born from death. Amen.